I'd like to welcome you today to the Dairy Xnet webinar on forage fermentation, how to make good silage. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Donna Amaral Phillips, Extension Dairy Specialist and Program Leader for Dairy Xnet. Today's webinar, Forage Fermentation, How to Make Good Silage, is, brought to you, is going to be presented by Lehman Cohn. He is um, a professor at the University of Delaware. He has a teaching research and extension appointment there. He researches um, quite heavily on forage quality and silage fermentation and is known as an expert throughout the world on this particular topic. He received his BS and master's degrees from the University of Hawaii and his PhD from, the, from Michigan State University in dairy science. He also did a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin. For a while, he worked with Monsanto when they were doing their clinical trials on BST, and he has been at the University of Delaware for numerous years now. With that, I'd like to introduce Lyman, Lehman and ask him to talk about his topic today. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Donna. I want to um, thank uh, Donna and um, Nancy McGill and the uh, uh, Dairy Extension people for inviting me here today. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about forage fermentation and uh, how to make good silage. Um, realizing that we only have um, uh, 40 or 45 minutes to get through this, what I'm going to try to do is to present some of the uh, applied and basic facts about what contributes to um, forage and silage quality, talk a little bit about management, talk a little bit about digestibility, and what tools are available for us to uh, ensure that we have the best quality silage to feed our cows um, all year round. So to start off, um, the first slide that I'd like to, to show everybody is, is to talk about you know, what is the definition of a high quality silage or forage. And certainly when we're making silage and even bringing forage in from the field and making hay, the one thing that we all want to do is to maximize nutrient recovery from the field. Uh, we also want to have high nutritive concentrations of protein and starch and energy, but we also need to make sure that um, these nutrient components are highly digestible by the rumen microbes and, of course, by the cow themselves. Uh, we need to remember that just because on paper, for example, we might have something that's, you know, 23% protein for an alfalfa halide, which is, you know, relatively high for me, it, it, it might be that high of a number in, from a concentration standpoint, but if the digestibility is poor, in the cow and the, and the microbes in the cow's rumen, we really can't take advantage of all of that uh, protein that should be available. So one of the things that I like to start off with uh, in talks relative to silage production and quality is to show people that there's a pretty profound effect uh, between harvest quality and silo management, and that these two things can be uh, actually uh, interrelated. So I'm going to show everybody four different scenarios that you potentially are going to end up with at the end of the day every time you harvest, forage, and make silage. So in scenario one, we're going to start off and say, when you walk into the field, let's just say that you know you have poor quality forage in the field. So this could be the result of um, hail damage or uh, you know, out east several years ago we had hurricane damaging, damages to the crop. Uh, it might have been a drought year, or you might have had a first crop alfalfa that was down in windrows and maybe rained on two or three times and longer in the field than you wanted to. But if that material was coming out of the field in very poor quality and you followed it with poor harvest and silo management, you know at the end of the day what you have coming out of that silo is basically poor quality for, for the uh, entire uh, silo. In scenario number two, we start off with poor quality forage in the field, but let's just say that you're a really good harvest and saddle manager. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, you're still going to end up with poor quality silage. We're not going to be able to change poor quality material coming out of the field and make it excellent within the silo, even with good silo management. The third scenario that people are often faced with is this one here, where we start with high quality forage in the field, but then follow that with poor harvest and silo management, and that then could result in poor quality silage at feeding. The last scenario, which is really what we want everybody to try to be in, is to start with high quality forage in the field, follow that with good silo management, 
and then we've got excellent quality silage for feeding throughout the year. So the big issue that we see here is that three out of the four times we basically lost the ball game. And we can't afford to be in any of those top three categories if we really want to try to maximize net farm income. So today, although I'm not going to talk much a lot about uh, uh, quality forage coming out of the field, I really want to concentrate on what happens within the silo. But still, we've got to remember that we've got to get that stuff coming out of the field as good as possible. Of course, the reason that all of this is important is because forage has a, a net value for us. And I don't know what corn salad is selling for today in some place wherever you are in the country, but around here it's about $35 per ton. Um, remember two years ago it was probably $70 a ton. But regardless of what that is, if you just kind of put the pencil to it, and if you see in this left-hand column here, you see tons of silage per year, um, and then dry matter losses 10, 15, 20 percent, you can see that there's a significant amount of money that we're, we could lose uh, with poor silo management because of losses that occur in the silo. And unfortunately, nobody uh, recovers 100% of the material coming out of the field going through a silage fermentation. Um, even the best manager is probably going to lose anywhere from 8 to 10%. Uh, you can see that you could have losses that are 15 or 20%, and I've seen losses, as I'm sure you have as well, that are even larger than 20% coming out of certain silos depending on the conditions that they are uh, installed under. So the amount of money is, is, is key here for uh, maximizing net farm income. I think the, the other thing that people need to realize that if you're up in that 20% um, loss range or more within the silo of nutrients, you're probably going to have to expect lower uh, production and also higher concentrate costs. So these are um, added on uh, uh, negatives that, that you would see putting out really poor quality silage. Cows milk less, concentrate costs more, and you've lost the forage within the silo. So let's talk a little bit about alfalfa. Just, just a few slides here that just so people understand why it always appears that it's so difficult to make good alfalfa silage or haylage. Uh, the big thing that we are faced with is that alfalfa has a very high buffering capacity, and so it results in very slow silage fermentations. Um, it's also very difficult to wilt. Uh, alfalfa silages also easily go clostridial, especially when the moisture is very high. And a lot of times the substrate for fermentation can be limiting. Um, this is especially true when we have cloudy weather or heavy rains or, or prolonged wilt. Uh, alfalfa silage or haylage that's put up too dry is especially difficult to pack. Uh, this traps air within the silo and we result in um, heat damage protein. Um, and this is especially true for haylages put up um, greater than 50% dry matter or less than 50% moisture. So these are some of the reasons why alfalfa always is a big challenge for us. Um, uh, the buffering capacity especially is, is a big issue because of the slow fermentation and, and the slow process of getting the pH down to actually preserve our silages. Uh, in order to help with making good quality alfalfa silage, uh, one of the big things that has been talked about over the years is um, uh, minimizing wilting time because the crop lying in the wind wall is still respiring and utilizing energy and using up fermentable carbohydrates in that time that is wilting. And so people have gone to wide swathing to minimize wilting time. Uh, we would also probably want to try to help alfalfa by maximizing the dry down time during hours of, of daylight because this is when we're getting active drying. We want to make sure that we wilt this material to at least 35% uh, dry matter or less than 65% dry matter. And that's primarily because um, clostridial fermentations like very wet conditions. On the other hand, uh, we want to probably avoid excessive dry matters, you know, not, not anything more than 50% because these fermentations tend to be restricted. Uh, they pack, uh, they're, they're difficult to pack, and thus these fermentations tend to be um, uh, challenging. We also don't want to be rained on, because obviously a rained on crop, crop will lead to some leaching of nutrients, but also it will increase wilting time, which is something we want to avoid. And we probably want to avoid mowing um, and harvesting under cloudy conditions because of um, 
uh, water soluble carbohydrates being uh, low. Uh, here are some consequences of extreme dry matters for alfalfa and grass silages. Um, on one side, we have material that's put up too wet. Uh, too wet for me is something that's uh, less than 30% dry matter or more than 70% moisture. Uh, cross studio fermentations lead to the protein degradation, dry matter and energy losses, uh, low digestibility, production of excessive butyric acid, and, and seepage. Um, it's kind of interesting. For, I know a lot of people don't realize this, but um, uh, uh, runoff and seepage from, from uh, very high moisture silos are, are very damaging to the environment. Um, the uh, uh, publications would suggest that uh, you know, one gallon of runoff from uh, a silo is enough to uh, contaminate 10,000 gallons of fresh water. And so uh, we want to really try to minimize the amount of seepage that we have. And of course, the way to do that is to, to make sure that we're at a high enough moisture, uh, so a high enough dry matter level to avoid the excessive uh, seepage from occurring. Uh, on the other hand, these sizes that are put up too dry are, again, as I had said earlier, are very difficult to pack. This leads to uh, very poor aerobic stability, which I'll show you in a second, uh, heat damage protein. And of course, one of the things that we see with uh, uh, silages that are heat damaged is not only is the protein damaged, but the fiber is damaged as well. And so that leads to low digestibility of both of those components. So now let's switch away from alfalfa and talk about corn silage. And what I'm, I have here is sort of uh, the results of what happens when we harvest corn silage at the extremes, uh, either too early or too late. Um, and with corn silage, of course, too early and too late are, are, uh, are locked in with um, moisture or dry matter. So anything on, on the left side, which would be harvested too early for corn silage, for me anyway, is if you're less than 28 or 30% uh, dry matter, so if you're more than 70% moisture, this tends to be a problem. Uh, very early harvested corn silage obviously has a low starch concentration because uh, the kernels haven't filled out yet. Uh, energy can be low in some of these crops. Uh, the big problem we see in most of these early harvested corn silages is the excess in acid production during fermentation. Uh, there's also a very high level of production of what we would consider wild acetic acid production. And of course, there's also seepage with this early harvested corn silage. Corn silage harvested too late or too mature would have actually a very high concentration of starch, but some of that starch might be low in digestibility because of the increase in the proline um, starch matrix that occurs as the plant matures. Um, there's also some issues with very high dry matter corn silages actually not having enough acid produced because at very high dry matters, microbial fermentation tends to be restricted. This material is also very difficult to pack and difficult, uh, uh, un, excuse me, material that is not packed very well always leads to poor aerobic stability in these silages. So for corn silage, uh, the optimum harvest time is, is whole plant dry matter of about 32 to 36 percent. At this point, we have a relatively good starch content with good digestibility, good fiber digestion, and this allows us to have good packing within the silo as well. I borrowed this slide from um, Randy Shaver. Uh, I think we both used this for many years, but it basically um, is trying to um, uh, emphasize the fact that harvesting whole plant corn uh, at very high dry matters or in a very mature state is not very desirable. And so Randy's slide here basically shows Starch digestibility in the track of the cow being 95 to 97 percent. Uh, that's typical for, or, or actually optimal for most uh, good lactation cow diets to have in that 95, 97 percent starch digestibility. But you can see that as the plant uh, matures over time, moving from 30 to 35 to 40 to 45 percent dry matter, we see uh, a very rapid decline in starch digestibility within the cow. And again, this is because of the uh, prolamine uh, starch matrix becoming more complex as the plant becomes more and more mature. Uh, another thing that is really important for um, corn silage is, is setting our top length. Um, and for 
corn silage that's not processed. Uh, the left-hand column basically shows the distribution on the four-pan Penn State separator box. And then uh, for, for what that chocolate should be if you're processed, uh, you can find these every place on the web. So I won't spend too much time here talking about chocolate, except that to emphasize the fact that obviously chocolate is important because we need to get these cows to have enough effective fiber that they can chew and produce um, good amounts of, of natural saliva that can, contains buffing capacity to keep the rumen pH in the optimum range. And chopping is also important because if our material is chopped actually too coarsely, we have issues with packing densities, which traps air that leads to um, poor fermentations. Uh, obviously, for me, the one thing that I try to emphasize is with chocolate, with corn silage, and actually with alfalfa and all crops is to try to get these things tested in the field while you're chopping with this Penn State box or whatever mechanism you have. Because um, you know, coming in post facto to a farm in December or January and boxing the material and telling them that your chocolate was, was um, uh, not optimum is too late for me. So we want to try to make sure that we know that we're at our, our good top length as we're going into the silo at harvest time. Uh, processing is very important as well. Um, I didn't think I would still be talking about processing uh, several years ago, but we still are. And it's amazing how many places that I go to that are, are still have poorly processed corn silage. Um, and we know that processing is important because it cracks the kernels open and exposes the starch for digestibility. Uh, processing reduces TMR sorting. It also certainly impacts uh, uh, silage packing and improves packing density as well. And so we really got to make sure that this occurs because what this does is affect starch digestibility. And if, again, we go back to the definition of having a high quality silage, something that has nutrients that are highly digestible, we want to be in this 97% plus uh, starch digestibility range for our corn silages. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from Jimmy Ferguson's work that he had done several years ago, where he looked at uh, fecal starch components uh, from lactating cows and uh, showed that uh, uh, fecal starch concentration can actually uh, increase. And obviously, it's highly correlated with apparent digestibility of the feed. And the goal is actually to have less than about 3 to 4 percent fecal starch. Um, a 1% unit decrease in fecal starch leads to about a pound more milk. And you can see that some, some of these uh, uh, samples that he took from herds in the Pennsylvania area had fecal starches that were you know, certainly above the 3 to 4% range, which were uh, not optimized. Uh, it is also very uh, surprising to me over all these years how few people um, have actually used the corn silage processing score that was developed by Dave Mertens and others at the USDA Forge Lab. But um, I would implore people to, to try to use this processing score to get an idea of how well your corn silage actually is processed. Um, the processing score, in a nutshell, is based on taking a sample, sending it into the Forge Lab. They dry it down. They put it through a set of screens. Um, and the percent of starch passing through the coarse screen, which has holes with, that have diameters of 4.75 millimeters, really is, is what we're looking for when we're looking at the processing rank. So if a sample has greater than 70% of its starch passing through that 4.75 millimeter screen, we would consider that sample as optimum. 70 to 50% would be average and less than 50% would be considered inadequately processed. Now, I guess the one limitation of the corn size processing score, uh, or the big limitation of this, is that um, this is not something that, that can be used real time. And so um, you know, for someone that's on a chopper saying, running through the field, opening a field up, and looking at, at your samples, you know, you're not going to be able to send a sample in and get the results back fast enough. And so that is a limitation of the, of the scoring system. Um, however, it is this time of the year when after you've done and everything's in the silo, you want to see, did I do a good job processing? It is something that is probably worthwhile doing. Um, I just want to also 
give people an idea of what a 4.75 millimeter screen is because I think I think most people are kind of shocked when they see what the diameter of this hole is. So this picture shows what a 4.75 millimeter screen is relative to kernel, pieces of kernels of corn. And this picture is interesting because I used to use this picture. This is one of the first pictures that I took years and years ago of a processed corn silage. And I, in the early days, I actually used to use this picture and say, you know, most of these pieces of corn here are well processed and this is good processing. But when you look at that 4.75 millimeter a hole, which is about a fifth of an inch, realizing that if starch does not go through that hole, that it's not well processed enough. This picture actually shows a perfect example of, of most of these uh, um, particles not being well processed enough, even though they are uh, broken up in pieces. So the thumb rules that someone could use uh, live in the field uh, are, are the ones that I, I don't know where the numbers actually originated from, but I know it's something that most of us in the field have used over the years, is that 95% of the kernels uh, ought to be cracked. And I would add the caveat then that probably, you know, 70% or more of the kernels ought to be a third to a quarter kernel in size, because that's about what will go through about a 4.75 millimeter hole. And that Technically, nicking and crushing are not enough. So just want to give a heads up for people that, you know, when you hear somebody that says, well, all you need to do is just nick that kernel or crush that kernel, uh, I don't believe that's enough based on uh, starch having to go through that 4.75 millimeter diameter hole. And of course, what you can do in the field uh, live uh, is to use the uh, what I call the bucket of water test, and this works only for freshly chopped corn forage. It doesn't work for uh, material that has been sitting in the field, uh, in the silo, excuse me, for, for a month or a couple months. But in freshly chopped corn forage, if you take it off of the wagon and you fill a, um, you know, a five liter pail with water, throw in four or five handfuls of, of that chopped material, swirl it around, what will happen is that most of the corn kernels will drop to the bottom of the pail, and the stalk, the stems, the leaves, the husk will float. And you can actually pour off the top of this material, uh, remove all the large particles, slowly pour out the water, fill up your bucket about two or three times, and do the same kind of uh, wash and rinse uh, procedure. And at the end of the day, what you'll have at the last uh, uh, rinse out, you'll have what's on the right side of the screen here, which will be on your corn kernels at the bottom, and then you can make a subjective assessment of, are, do I have, you know, 70% of my kernels, uh, you know, at a third or a quarter size? And I think this is a the example that I have here on the on on the on the screen shows something that that's headed towards that optimum uh, in terms of well being well processed. Um, kind of interesting thing that I saw. Uh, a few months ago on a farm in, um, in Pennsylvania was a, a post processor. And so um, this was a dairy that was milking 1,000 cows with uh, 500 replacement animals. And they had issues with uh, a custom processor not being able to um, uh, get their corn size processed where they wanted to be, but they couldn't fire their, their custom person because that's who they had. And so what they did was they designed and worked with Lancaster silos and developed a post processor. And um, I was I was I didn't see the this actually working, but the the farm manager told me that they were able to uh, reprocess a day's worth of corn silage for that herd in about 35 minutes. And so um, this might be something that as we go into the future, um, uh, people might think about. You know, especially something like this for maybe four or five farms in a, in, a, in a small area, especially if they're smaller dairies, could share something like this. So it's just something to think about from the standpoint of post-processing and actually getting the job done correctly. All right, so let's talk real quickly about the goals of making silage. Um, uh, rapid preservation for, our, for uh, maximum recovery of nutrients is important. Uh, this is what I call the front end. We have the back end, which is where we want to preserve this material and make have good shelf life. 
the most important thing for people to realize is that when we make silage, silage is like making is like a war. There are good bugs and there are bad bugs, and at the end of the day, the good bugs need to win the battle. I'm going to show you a couple of slides that have the same format. Uh, this is an ideal fermentation with good storage conditions. So what happens at the, at the start of making silage is that forage is chopped, it's put into the silo. If we get air out of the systems, the sugars disappear over time. They disappear over time because lactic acid is produced by the good bacteria. This drops the pH. There's a little acetic acid made as well. Okay? In the back end, during storage, if we keep the air out of the system, it's stable. And basically, nothing happens very much. We do get some heating in the beginning of, of fermentation that occurs. And, and this is because of the natural microbial processes. But you can see over the back end of storage, there's really no significant heating that occurs. So this is a good fermentation that occurs quickly. Um, you can see that the movement of all these items here plateaus out very rapidly. And that's really our goal, to get the fermentation to occur as quickly as possible and stabilize as quickly as possible so that we can maximize the recovery of, of nutrients within the silo. However, I want to point out that a good fermentation does not always lead to good stability at the back end. Um, and, and this is because a high concentration of lactic acid and low pH alone does not automatically equate to a stable silage. So let me show you how this kind of works. So I'm going to show you again the front end fermentation where there's no air in the system, the sugars disappear, there's lactic acid, the pH drops. Scenic is there. But now look what happens in the back end if we expose this to air. Something quite different. We no longer have a stable system. And we also get heating that occurs. And so what occurs now is that we have exposed silage to air. And there is a chain reaction or, or domino effect that occurs because of that air within the system. And the chain reaction that occurs is listed here, where silage is exposed to air. Bad yeasts that were asleep in our silage wake up. They degrade lactic acid. Their numbers increase. They degrade highly nutritious ingredients. Heat's produced. The pH increases. And then molds and bacteria wake up, causing more heating and even more spoilage. And so the key to, for us to be able to stop the chain reaction from occurring is to limit the exposure of, of silage to air and or limit the number of yeast so that the chain reaction occurs at a slower pace. Uh, here's the relationship between the numbers of these bad yeast that are in silage and aerobic stability. And the take home from this slide basically shows you that at about at the far right end of the slide, at about a million yeast per gram, aerobic stability is basically zero. So that means that this silage will spoil immediately if you already are starting with a high a population of yeast. And as you can see, the fewer and fewer yeast you have, the more and more stable silage is when it's exposed to air and the longer it takes to spoil. Um, yeast in, in uh, our silages and TMRs and spoiling material is, is bad because uh, it can uh, uh, result in low dry matter intakes, lower digestibility. Uh, this was a study that was done a few years ago by one of my grad students with um, a spoiling TMR. You can see that the unspoiled TMR had 108,000 yeast per gram in it. The spoiled TMR had 66 million yeast per gram in it. And you can see that there was a um, significant decrease in uh, dry matter intake for these heifers. These were heifers, not lactating cows. Uh, there are other undesirable types of fermentations that can occur, too. Let me just show you uh, the clostridial fermentation. This is forages that are, are too wet, especially alfalfa and grasses, uh, not corn silages. Um, but low sugar or um, contaminated heavily with, with soil or manure. You can see that the sugar content starts off lower than in most crops. Lactic acid, acetic acid. And then pH, and then butyric acid increases. And so we end up with a very odd but undesirable type of fermentation 
that really never stabilizes out until very, very late in the process. Uh, the one good thing is that clostridial silages don't heat, but the bad thing is that there is excessive breakdown of nutrients, proteins, and butyric acid can actually uh, lead to uh, um, uh, ketosis type problems. So the other thing that we need to make sure we do uh, as we get our crops into the silo is to make sure that we fill quickly and pack tightly. Um, we have um, I've been proponents of this for, for many, many years. Uh, try to get a good cap for corn silage of about 14 to 16 pounds for dry matter per cubic foot. Uh, alfalfa is probably more up into that 17 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. Um, I've seen corn silage is the hay the, the, the tightest or the high packing density that one would see in the field are probably in the 20s. It, you don't see that very often, but it certainly is up there once in a while. And we need to make sure that we basically have pack tractors that have a good weight on them and that we're filling and packing continuously and packing in, in uh, small layers to make sure this material packs very well. Oops, sorry. Uh, plastic and sidewalls has also been helpful for a lot of people to prevent uh, seepage coming in from the, from the wall. And of course, water brings oxygen into the system and can start the domino uh, effect from, from occurring. Uh, it can also bring in uh, seepage, add to seepage, and, and leach nutrients. And so plastic on the sidewall has been very helpful to keep that water out of our silage mass. Uh, we need to cover with plastic immediately and tires. Uh, white plastic is, is better than black because it, it um, doesn't keep the heat in as, as much. Uh, six million is better than four because it's obviously thicker. If you've got small bunkers or small piles, you might want, want to consider having two layers of plastic. Uh, two layers would be better than one. You might want to have a thin layer on the bottom being best. And obviously, any place where you have um, a seam or an edge, You'd want to try to make sure that those seams and edges are weighted down as, as much as possible, because that is where air can get into the silage mass and start the uh, chain reaction of aerobic instability occurring. Uh, there are oxygen barrier plastics that are on the marketplace as well. Uh, these plastics bleed less uh, relative to uh, oxygen over a long period of time. And there are uh, several options out there in the marketplace for these oxygen barrier plastics. Uh, we don't like to see uh, the Chia pet cover. It's still amazing to me that when I go around the U.S., I still see someone that has seeded some type of crop on the top of a silo uh, as a silo cover, and, and we just really don't want to see this type of, of silo cover occurring. Uh, one thing for those of you that are, are with, uh, uh, doing a lot of bag silos, I want to make sure that, especially if you have one of these, uh, you know, have a Kelly Ryan or, or an ag bagger that have has a teeth in, the, in them in the auger, make sure that those teeth are sharp because uh, when these teeth get dull, they start to smush the silage and juice the silage more than if you have sharp teeth. Uh, the sharper teeth gives you faster, tighter packing and clear cuts, and so you have less juicing. Uh, at the face of your bunker or pile, you want to make sure that you keep the leading edge of that face down because this is a place where oxygen can get into the silage mass and start the chain reaction of aerobic spoilage. Face management is also important to make sure that we maintain our silage quality. Um, there is no magic number on how much you should remove per day because it depends on a number of things. For example, pack density, moisture, ambient temperature, et cetera. Um, but what you want to do basically is to remove enough silage per day to keep ahead of the chain reaction and keep ahead of spoilage. And obviously, this is more important in hot weather than in cold weather. But we try to keep our faces clean, minimize damage to the face, and knock down only enough silage to feed uh, for that feeding or that day, again, depending on what the ambient temperature and the weather is like. So there is um, 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 a management disconnect uh, in terms of uh, face shavers sometimes. Um, I have been on farms where uh, people have been very happy with face shavers, but, but then when you go up to it and actually see the silos, uh, 
the, the, the face is really not really well managed um, or the plastic is, is loose on the face. Um, this is some information that I actually borrowed from uh, Brian Holmes uh, looking at face shavers where he said that uh, the most positive effect of face shavers is when our density is low and our feed out rate is low and that you may save about 3% in dry matter but then there's always a questioning in terms of savings in terms of animal performance and the longer feeding time. And actually, that's the disconnect here. So this was a farm that I was on several years ago who was actually using a face shaver and very happy, at, happy with it. But as you can see, there was a disconnect relative to overall management and the tool that they were using. So at, at the end, let's talk about microbial inoculants. Um, they're a tool that we can can be used to improve fermentation and aerobic stability. We can have help at the front end with homolactic acid bacteria, faster fermentations, reduced clostridia, improved dry matter energy recoveries. We can also have help at the back end with lactobacillus buchneri type products, which are improved specifically to improve aerobic stability and keep feed fresher and keep it from spoiling. And then, of course, there are the combo products that have both the homolactic and the albuterol products together, those are also available within the marketplace as well. Uh, Muck used, um, um, uh, uh, has summarized the approaches to using silage inoculants, and I've kind of summarized them here. Uh, one, inoculants are useful for preventing a clostridial fermentation. Two, they could be important for improving aerobic stability. And three, it could be important for making a good fermentation better. My general inoculant recommendations by crop and dry matter are listed here. These are, of course, very broad. But by crop, for alfalfa and grasses, my suggestion would be to think about first a traditional homolactic acid-based bacterial additive. Um, for corn silage, I would probably use a homolactic or a combination product with buchneri and the homolactic. For high moisture corn, um, anything with buchneri is probably very useful because high moisture corn, the, the biggest challenge usually in warm weather is poor aerobic instability. By dry matter, you could look at something if you're very uh, high in moisture, so less than 30% dry matter, I would go with a straight homolactic bug, I would avoid lactobacillus buchneri in very, very wet silages. If you're over 40% dry matter, you might want to think about going with the lactobacillus plus homolactic acid bacteria combo product. Uh, lastly, when you manage your inoculants, it's important that to realize that we have a tool and then, then the tool must be used correctly. So we've got to calibrate our applicators frequently. We must optimize the distribution because the bugs don't swim around and, and distribute themselves. Uh, I will say that a liquid applied inoculant is better under drier conditions. So especially if you have forages that are in that 40 to 45 percent dry matter range, you probably get a bit better bang for your buck with a liquid applied inoculant than a dry because the drier forages tend to be more challenged in terms of microbial activity. And when you put a liquid inoculant on in a dry forage, it has a better chance of revival and fast revival. Um, I will advise against mixing inoculants in hot water. Uh, that is a very bad idea. Um, these inoculants don't like to be in hot water for a very long time. And they actually don't like to be hot water in tanks very long, applicator tanks very long as well. Uh, we've done a significant amount of work looking at viability of inoculant bacteria in, in hot water, and they just don't like to, to be in water alone if that temperature is much above 100 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Um, in a study that we did uh, recently, the biggest um, issue that we saw with hot water in, in, in inoculant tanks was in tanks that were uh, placed in a, a, a bad area on the chopper. So these tanks were actually uh, absorbing heat from either the exhaust or the motor from some of these choppers. And this is where these tanks 
can accumulate heat. In fact, this is a, um, a slide that shows a study that we had did last fall. Uh, these are about 55 tanks, half from California, half from um, Minnesota, Wisconsin. And, and what I'm showing here here is um, water temperature on the x-axis and the uh, expected bacterial numbers within the tanks. And the big thing that you want to see here is that if all these dots that, that are on the slide, if the number of expected bacteria in the inoculant tanks were where they were supposed to be theoretically, all of these dots would be on the zero line. And you can see that they're not. Um, there are two interesting things to take home from here. Is that one, you see a lot of dots that are actually above zero, which suggests that a lot of the concentrations in the tanks were higher than what they should have been theoretical. But that is because most reputable inoculant companies overfill their inoculants. And so you have more bacteria in the pouch than what is the minimum number of guarantee. So that's probably why you see a lot of these tanks have actually more than what the theoretical minimal is. The, the second but most important point is that about 20% of these tanks are actually below where they should be. And that's really where uh, um, uh, we need to, to try to fix. Now, that's very disturbing because when, once you get anything below uh, within this green box, anything that was put on at uh, an applied rate would basically be ineffective within um, the silo. And so you can see that the relationship as well, there's a negative relationship as the temperature in the water increases with what we theoretically should have had in the tank. And again, most of these tanks that are off here on the right side of the screen here are there because of placement of the tank. OK, so in summary, um, I just want to end with the fact that forage quality and silo management uh, have pretty uh, profound effects on, on net farm income. Uh, harvesting forage crops at optimum maturity obviously is the first place where we need to start. And then we need to follow that with best management practices for processing and storage. And we can use the tools that are available to us to measure these standards, things like using the Penn State box, things like using the corn silage processing score. And then, of course, using inoculants that are best suited uh, based on the needs that you might see for that specific crop. OK. So with that, thank you very much. And I think we'll put it back to um, uh, Thank you very much, Lehman. OK. Thank you, Donna. Question. Um, if there's two inoculants that contain the same type of bugs, can you expect them to perform equally? <laughs> OK, so uh, the answer to that question is, um, is no, unfortunately. Um, I guess um, the example I always use is that I could have two Holstein cows sitting in front of me. Uh, would I expect both of them to perform the same? And one cow could be making 50 pounds a day, and one could be 150 pounds a day. So, so um, that, obviously, I think is a good example of, of why you could have two different inoculants with the same names of bugs even, and they might not perform uh, equally. I guess the bigger question for me would be to follow up on that would be, well, then how can you tell <laughs> which one is better? And the best that I can do, which I tell everybody, is that you have to ask uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, companies for published independent data. Um, you know, can they show you? publications that support their data and their claims and that are in the Journal of Dairy Science or Journal of Animal Science or some other type of independently peer-reviewed publication. And that's about the best that we can do at the end of the day. OK, we have somebody else typing a question in. I have a question for you. One sure. of the things you talked about was um, when you get um, a anaerobic or aerobic instability in the silage that basically you lose your lactic and acetic acid. Yes. And one of the things that I've seen over my career is it's usually in baleage now. And I realize mm -hmm. you didn't talk about baleage today. And okay. usually it's in either alfalfa or in a um, 
spring crop wheat, mm -hmm. we see lack of fermentation, any fermentation. Mm -hmm. Acetic acid, acetic acid levels are low. Do you have any stipulation of what could have happened to some of those crops? Where would you start troubleshooting, I guess, is my question. Yeah, well, one, one of the things that I would do first is, is determine where, uh, what time of year was that bailage made. So, for example, I mean, you know, the, the obvious thing would be that if that bailage was made in, in the late fall and temperatures were very cool, that you, you might have, have harvested and, and installed that under conditions where your natural epiphytic counts were very low, and then the temperatures got very cold, so cold that basically nothing fermented. Right, so so that obviously is a possibility. Uh, sometimes when we see if if Levin, are you still there? Did we lose Lehman? I'm still here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you. You cannot. No. Nancy, oh. can you hear me? Now I can. Go ahead. Okay. You talked to me, but I didn't, couldn't hear you finish the question. Oh, okay. So, so the, it, it, on one scenario, if that bailage was put up under very cold conditions, it may not have fermented just because there wasn't enough heat to keep the bugs alive. Um, if, you, if that bailage did not ensile and conditions were not cold and they were actually warm, but it still did it in style, that's probably a result of, of uh, not having enough available moisture for the bacteria to grow on. And so, because what happens with, with bailage, you know, is that we're wrapping this material and it's not chopped to pieces like, like something that would go into a bag or into a silo. And so even though the moisture is there, the moisture is tied up in the plant. And so the amount of available moisture for fermentation becomes even less and less in, in, in bailage. And so if that bailage were put up a little on the dry side, there just may not be enough uh, um, available moisture for, for anything to grow on. Mm -hmm. So that's a possibility. We have another question that came through the chat box. Do you have any practical recommendations for determining the adequate number of packing tractors or weight of tractors for incoming silage? Yeah, that's uh, actually, I don't, I'm not sure if the, um, uh, uh, if, if Brian can, can chime in here, but I see that, I know that Brian Holmes was on, on in the, uh, in the chat box on, uh, but the University of Wisconsin actually has a really nice uh, Excel spreadsheet that you can download that can get you that information. It, it actually, you actually put in how much material you bring in, tons per hour, uh, how big is your silo, uh, what the dry matter content is, and it will actually tell you how much pack weight you need uh, to get that material to reach a certain target. I, I see that Brian is typing that, so maybe Brian's typing that link in. We'll wait and see what he says. Um, Brian basically said you can look on Team Forage, the harvesting storage website, and there is the um, spreadsheet there. Um, and there's one also for piles. So basically, um, University of Wisconsin website, um, Team Forage, um, and looking under the whole harvesting and storage um, component of that website. Yep. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. Lehman, we greatly appreciate um, you taking time to do this topic for us. Okay. And it's very, very practical, and hopefully we can get good quality silage put up and feed our cows and reduce feed shrink out there. Good. Thank All right. You're welcome. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Nancy. Mm -hmm.